So, quick announcement. Um, the, let's see, it's a week from today that the project outline is due, March 5th. So, uh, the instructions are on the web page. I think I said one to two pages with some further detailed instructions. Any questions about that, about the project? Okay, good. So, uh, look forward to receiving those. Um, all right, so let me help you page back in where we were. So we're smack in the middle of part four of the course. And the attitude we have in part four is that we insist that our mechanisms be simple. Maybe not to play, but certainly to describe and execute. Okay? And then the question then is just, if we stick only to simple auctions, when do they do well? Under what kinds of conditions? By do well, I mean their equilibria, for some type of equilibria. Um, and you know, conditions perhaps on the valuations or what ge generality of equilibria uh, that we're looking at. So last lecture, I introduced our first simple auction format, which is basically you throw up a bunch of uh, items at the same time on eBay and you try to sell them. So simultaneous second price auctions. So S2A <coughs> is the abbreviation. I'm going to be using. And again, I, I want to remind you, this is sort of very different than all the auctions that we saw in the past, in the sense that these are auctions where the action space, so in other words, what a player is, is able to do or able to report, is way smaller than its type space or its valuation space. So again, we're thinking of bidders as having combinatorial valuations, think like submodular valuations. They have like two to the M private parameters if there's M goods, but I'm only gonna listen to M numbers. Okay, all I let you do in this auction is submit one bid for each of the M items. Each of them is then sold with the Vickery auction to the highest bidder or the second highest price. So bidders have to somehow figure out how to communicate the most relevant information for the items that they want using this very small action space. Okay? So it's a very simple mechanism to execute or describe, not necessarily that easy to figure out how to bid. Okay? So we got off to a good start with our agenda of proving near optimality guarantees for welfare for simple auction formats. Here's what we proved last time. So we made the following two assumptions. So we thought about bidders with submodular valuations. Actually, it was a little bit more general than that. So in fact, it was okay for bidders. If you want, you can just think submodular, that's fine. Uh, but technically, we proved them for what are called XOS or fractionally subadditive valuations. That just means the valuation is the maximum of a bunch of additive valuations. Okay, we proved a lemma last week saying that every submodular valuation indeed can be represented as the maximum of additive valuations. Okay, so we proved this for even more general than the class of submodular valuations. That was one assumption. And, uh, and, you know, so this is certainly a restriction on valuations, but don't forget how hard we were struggling with this when we were doing things like incentive compatible mechanism design. Okay, so this is already a challenging problem. We never had a DSIC mechanism, for example, that handled bidders with arbitrary submodular valuations. So to prove guarantees with some simple auction in equilibrium, that feels like a victory. Uh, then what were we looking at? So last week we only discussed pure Nash equilibria, not really because they're well motivated, just because I wanted to sort of, you know, um, impose layers of, uh, you know, complexity gradually throughout the lectures. So we thought about pure equilibria. We'll move on to other equilibrium concepts today. And also remember that with second price auctions, we have to make uh, another assumption about uh, the equilibrium. Even in the Vickery auction, with just one item and two bidders, you have these bluffing equilibria. You have these problems with overbidding. Okay, so maybe I va my value is zero, but I bid really high. And if, if you bid really low, then I don't actually have to pay the price for it. Okay, so you have these low welfare equilibria, even in the Vickery auction, caused by overbidding. So what we did is we only proved guarantees for equilibria without overbidding. Okay. And the precise, uh, it's not very important uh, for today, or, but the precise definition we used is just that if you looked at the bundle that the items that a bidder won, then the sum of its bids for those items was at most its value for those items. Okay, that's what we proved the factor two approximation for. Okay? And so if these are met, then we prove that the welfare of this pure national equilibria is at least one half times the opt welfare. I also showed you an example that the one half is tight. 
Okay, there's an example, just two items, two bidders, unit demand valuations, a pure Nash equilibrium with no overbidding, and it was off by 50%, okay, because the bidders kind of got miscoordinated uh, on the two items. Each one got the one that they didn't really want, okay? So I think that brings us up to date. Okay, that was the last lecture, all right? So now, where, where are we going to go from here, to sort of give you the big picture? So the main focus of the first lecture today is going to be to go beyond pure Nash equilibria. With, so pure Nash equilibria, equilibria, that's a full information concept. Okay, so that's for games where players know what everybody wants. And in auctions, generally, when you think about them, people don't know what each other wants. Right? So if I'm in a first price auction with one of you, uh, you know, I'm trying to guess what you're going to bid, and the reason that's hard for me is because I don't actually know what you're willing to pay. So the more suitable equilibrium concept uh, to study equilibrium and efficiency in auctions is Bayes-Nash equilibria. Okay, so that's the main topic for the first lecture. I also want to give you some exposure to other simple auction formats, not just this one, simultaneous second price auction. So in the second lecture today, we'll talk about first price auctions, which are well motivated in this context. Okay? But again, as far as what's, what's on tap, uh, we want to do the price of anarchy. We're going to stick with this auction format for the current lecture. S2As, but we want to look at the price of anarchy of Bayes-Nash equilibria. Okay? Good. In fact, and I'll, I'll put this somewhere as an optional exercise, but if all we cared about were the pure equilibria uh, of second price simultaneous auctions, something I proved to you earlier would have already been enough. So earlier we looked at, and it won't be obvious why these are connected, although it's actually a pretty easy proof. Um, so we took the Kelso Crawford auction, so that was the ascending auction that I showed you way back when we were talking about gross substitutes. I showed you the Kelso Crawford auction, and the main point when I first showed you that auction is that if bidders have gross substitutes valuations and they all bid sincerely, then the auction terminates at a well rising equilibrium, which in particular is welfare maximizing. Then we actually returned, I don't know if you remember, but we returned to the, the Kelso Crawford auction when I first told you about submodular valuations. And I said, as a thought experiment, we were asking, you know, how easy, for ignoring incentives, how easy is just the welfare maximization problem with some modular valuations. So I said, as a thought experiment, imagine we just ran Kelso Crawford and let it terminate, okay? In general, there aren't more wires in equilibria for some modular valuations, so it's not going to be optimal. But actually, we proved that it's within a factor two. Okay, so Kelso Crawford terminates for submodular valuations with a well with an allocation within a factor two of welfare. It turns out, via sort of a simulation argument, uh, you can show that pure equilibria in the simultaneous second price auctions correspond to the kinds of outcomes you get from Kelso Crawford with submodular valuations. So we actually could have proved this too just from inheritance from the work we did a few weeks ago. Now, don't get me wrong, I didn't waste your time last week because the way we prove this is important for the results I'm going to show you today on Bayes-Nash equilibria. Okay, but if all we cared about were pure Nash equilibria, we wouldn't have needed to do that work last week. Okay? All right, so lots of connections between the different, different things we've been talking about. So how are we going to go about this? How are we going to prove bounds on, the, on the, how good Bayes-Nash equilibria are? Well, here's the plan. Um, I'm going to ask you to remember, not in detail, but just sort of in spirit, one of the major themes uh, from the Price of Anarchy section of last quarter's course, from 364A, namely extension theorems. So one of the main points I tried to convey is that very often when you're bounding the price of anarchy of games in lots of different application domains, uh, you can get away with the following analysis approach. You can prove a POA bound only for the pure Nash equilibria of a game, just like we did last week for simultaneous second price auctions. And then as long as your proof for pure Nash equilibria conforms to a certain template, meets some additional conditions, then in fact, basically with no extra work, you get the same bound in 364A, we were talking about uh, mixed Nash equilibria, correlated equilibria, and coarse correlated equilibria. So back in 364A, we were talking about things like routing games and facility location games, this kind of stuff. And we were criticizing pure Nash equilibria. We said, well, first of all, it might not exist all the time. In some classes of games, it does, but some classes of games, it doesn't. But then secondly, you know, even if it does exist, it could be hard to compute, like PLS complete. And even mixed Nash equilibria, there always exist, but they can be hard to comp compute, like PPAD 
uh, hard to compute. And so instead, we talked about these learning algorithms, uh, these sort of weaker equilibrium concepts, correlated and coarse correlated equilibria, for which there are learning algorithms that quickly converge to them. So those are tractable equilibrium concepts. And so that's why we were really happy to have price of anarchy bounds, not just for pure Nash equilibria, but also for these much bigger sets, more tractable sets, uh, correlated and coarse correlated equilibria. Okay, so that's just sort of a brief review of what we did in you know, weeks six and seven, I think, of last quarter. Now, why do I bring that up here? Well, here we're in sort of exactly the same kind of situation. As analysts, as actually like someone who has to write down a proof, we're much happier if all we have to do is worry about pure Nash equilibria. Okay, and that's why we warmed up with pure Nash equilibria last week. But what do we really care about in an auction context? Well, we don't really care about pure Nash equilibria. They're, they're not really modeling what we're trying to get at, this incomplete information aspect of auctions. What we care about are the Bayes Nash equilibria with respect to some prior distribution. But this, these extension theorems from last quarter maybe give us some hope that we can be lazy. Maybe just like we had extension theorems that allow us to extend bounds from pure equilibria to things like correlated equilibria, maybe we can have extension theorems that extend bounds to pure equilibria to Bayes Nash equilibria. Okay, and we will. Okay, that's going to be, you know, somewhat explicit in the discussion for this lecture. So that's the plan. Okay? All right. So this is what's easy to argue about. This is what's well motivated. All right. So, let me remind you what, you know, the high-level outline of the proof of this result that we did last week. Okay, so let me, let me remind you how we did this. So key step in proof, let me also just sort of remind you a little bit about price of anarchy proofs. So the first step in almost any price of anarchy proof is you have to figure out how to use the equilibrium hypothesis. Okay, and so what, is, what does that do? It says, well, you know, if this player switched, it would be even worse off. Why is that useful? It gives us a very flexible way of deriving lower bounds on the equilibrium utility of a player. Okay, anything that it would switch to, its utility would only go worse. So that gives us a lower bound on how well it's doing in equilibrium. So in constructing the proof then, the question is, all right, well, so what hypothetical deviation should we plug in to the equilibrium condition? Last quarter, it was kind of very easy when we weren't talking about auctions. We were talking about things like routing games. We just said, well, let's look at the path this player is supposed to be taking in the optimal solution, and let's just think about switching to that. There's sort of a, there's this extra level of indirection, however, in auctions, which makes things a little, take, forces us to be a little bit more creative. So what we'd like to say is, well, look, right, so we're at some equilibrium. It doesn't have full welfare. Let's look at the best allocation. And why doesn't this player just switch to grabbing items three, five, and seven? Okay. But if you think about it, that's not quite well defined because, you know, the actions of a player are not grab three goods. The actions of a player are submit a bid, bid vector, okay? And sort of lots of different collections of bid vectors give rise to exactly the same allocation, okay? So if what we care about is a welfare maximizing allocation amongst the infinite number of bid vectors that induce it, we have to somehow figure out which one to use in our proof, okay? So, I, we sort of started this with a unit demand case where, and the whole reason I started the unit demand case is because this particular challenge is relatively easy to see what to do, right? So for the unit demand case, where every bidder is only gonna get one item in any sensible allocation, now you can just say, well, we're at an equilibrium. You know, this bidder I, maybe it's supposed to get some item J in the optimal solution. And so now intuitively we use the deviation where I just goes all in for item J meaning it bids zero on anything not equal to J, and it bids its full value on the item J. And that was sort of the natural way of sort of trying to grab item J off the shelf. So that was the unit demand warm-up. Then, you know, the whole reason XOS fits in so naturally here as the maximum of additive valuations is because, you know, basically um, there is a sensible way to define this exact same thing. What, what exactly should be the, the deviating bit? So what we did in the, in the proof is, you know, given the bidder's valuations and there's some bid profile that we're trying to lower bound the welfare of, we exhibited deviations, B star one up to B star n. So again, in the unit demand case, B star one was just, look at what item one's supposed to get in the optimal solution, bid zero and everything else and its value for that item. In the general XOS case, we said, well, let's look at the items 
the bitter one gets in the optimal solution. Let's look at the additive valuation. Remember, this XOS valuation is the maximum of additive valuations. So let's look at the additive valuation, which is tight for, say, items 3, 5, and 7, whatever one gets in the optimal solution. And then that'll tell us exactly what numbers to bid on items 3, 5, and 7. And we bid zero for everywhere else. Okay? So again, even in the XOS case, how do we construct this hypothetical deviation? We look at the items we're supposed to get in the optimal solution, and we go all in for those items. And the exact meaning of all in is given by these added evaluations in the support of VI. Okay, so that's where these B star I's came from. Okay, and um, here's how, right, so, so that's, that was the definition of B star I, and now I'm going to write down kind of the major milestones in the proof, okay, the inequalities that we had. So, right, so this is what we wanted, the lower bound. So we were starting for some equilibrium B. So think of this as a, so not all of the steps of the proof will require this, but sort of in the motivating case, we're thinking of, B is being a pure Nash equilibrium, satisfying no overbidding. But we'll keep track in these inequalities exactly where these hypotheses are used. So the first thing we did is trivial, which is we just said, well, instead of lower bounding the welfare, we're going to lower bound an even smaller quantity, which is just the sum of the player utilities. Okay. So remember, this is, this is values minus prices. Okay, so this is this, this is just the values, this is that minus prices. So that's clearly only smaller, prices are only non-negative. Um, then, we use the fact that we're dealing with a pure Nash equilibrium to say that any deviation only makes people worse, in particular switching to the hypothetical deviation B star I only makes I worse. And then the relatively hard work, which was just sort of a bunch of manipulation, was, as usual with these price vanity type proofs, we have to relate this entangled term to stuff we actually care about, like welfares of the equilibrium and the optimal solution. And specifically, you know, the bulk of the work was proving that we could lower bound the sum of these things by the optimal welfare, which is great, but, you know, there's a price to pay, there's an error term, so minus something, right? So this is what we want, this is what we want to say is big. This is our equilibrium welfare. This is exactly the target, so that's great. And then the error term we proved was the sum of the equilibrium bids. Okay, so look at all the players. This is the set of items that I wins in the equilibrium B. And then I just look at uh, what I bid for it. Now remember, these are second price auctions, so this is not necessarily what I is paying for J. This is what it bid for J. What it pays may be much less, the second highest bid. Okay. So that was, the, that was the hard work. So this is where we basically looked at each item separately, and we said, well, look, either there's some other bid which is high or there isn't. In the first case, then the relevant term is sort of non-positive and we're done. In the other case, it wins at the appropriate price and, and we've got what we want. Okay, so that's that we did last time. And then in the final step is where we applied the no overbidding. So no overbidding exactly says that w the sum of your bids on what you win should be at most your value for it. So by no overbid. Okay, so we can upper bound the error term by the sum of the VI of SIs, okay, which is just, of course, the welfare at equilibrium. Okay. And so then rearranging, we got the factor two. So any questions about that? So this again is review, but it, you may recall this from sort of the smoothness discussion last quarter, but these proofs is really important to focus in your proof on exactly where you're using which hypotheses. It's actually very crucial for these extension theorems that in some sense you only use your hypothesis in a restricted way, in restricted regions of the proof. That's why I'm spelling it out again. Okay. Any questions about this? This is what we did. All right, so let's actually talk a little bit about where 
various where our various hypotheses get used in steps one through four. All right, so first of all, and this, this has the same spirit as last quarter, the equilibrium hypothesis, the fact that B is a pure natural equilibrium, is used in a minimal way in this proof. Of course it has to be true somewhere. We're not going to prove a factor two bound for every single bit vector in the world, arbitrarily stupid ones. So it has to be used somewhere, and it's used right here. Okay, it's used in step two. For each, and we use it once for each player, we pretty much have to use it once for each player, and we just say the utility is lower bounded by if it's switched to this B star I deviation. Okay? It's obvious that the hypothesis is not being used in one. Okay, that's just uh, trivial inequality. It's obvious it's not being used in four, because that's just from no overbidding. Uh, you know, just go back to your notes from last week to verify that it's not being used in three either. Okay, and this is the same as last quarter. Last quarter, the part of price of anarchy proofs where you actually had to do some hard work, it never involved the equilibrium hypothesis. It always just involved inequalities and manipulation. Same thing here, okay? So it's not obvious from what I wrote on the board, but just trust me or check your notes. We didn't use the equilibrium hypothesis in two either. Uh, sorry, in three either. That holds for an arbitrary bid vector B, not only pure equilibria. Okay, so P and E hypothesis used only in two, not one or three or four. Okay? So that's the first point. The other important point, so let's look at these uh, deviations B star I. Okay? So suppose we're trying to so so suppose we're trying to figure out B star one. Okay, so remember what B star one is. B star one says look at what items you're supposed to get in the optimal solution, and go all in bidding for those items you're supposed to get in the optimal solution. So let me ask you. So let's try to understand you know what information we need for this to be well defined. Okay. So do I need to know the valuation profile V for this deviation B star one to be well defined? So B star 1 says, look at the items you're supposed to get in the optimal solution and go all in. So suppose, there was, suppose I didn't tell you what the valuation profile was. Would that make sense? No, right? Because the optimal allocation is a function of the valuation profile. Right? Optimal allocation means welfare maximizing sum of the VIs. How do you know what maximizes the sum of the VIs without knowing the VIs? What if I told you just I's value, what if I told you just bidder one's valuation and I didn't tell you valuations V2 through VN? Would that, would that be enough for B star one to be well defined? No, it still wouldn't be, right? So the optimal allocation is a function of all of the VIs, not just V1, okay? So, okay, good. So what if I just tell you the valuation profile V and I don't tell you the current equilibrium bid vector B. Okay, so you know V, but you don't know B. Do you have enough information to define B star one? Yeah. Yeah, you do. The definition we're talking about for B star one is independent of anything other than the valuation profiles. Remember, how do you define it? Look at the optimal allocation, that's a function of V only, whatever it is, and go all in. And that's a function of your own valuation only, okay? So this is important, all right? So B star one through B star N, they're constructed oblivious to what equilibrium B we're talking about, okay? They depend on V, all of the components, not just VI. They don't depend on B at all. Good. So choice of B star one, B star N, depends on V, but not B, okay? All right, so let me, let me just derive a sort of immediate uh, conclusion from these two points. Uh, so, you know, again, I don't expect you to remember the details, but this will, you know, I'll tell you this is true, and it'll be easy for you to verify going back to your notes for last quarter. This is exactly the definition of a smoothness proof that I gave you last quarter. 
Okay, so what we did last quarter is I gave you a couple of concrete examples in routing games and facility location games. I gave you this template, what are the steps in the proof, and the key insight in, in, the, in, in what was common in those proofs is that you only use the pure equilibrium hypothesis in a very restricted way. You use it once per player, and you use it for hypothetical deviations which are defined independent of the equilibrium. Okay, that's exactly what we're doing here. All right, so this literally is exactly meets the definition I gave you last quarter. Okay? So I'll just state that. That's not the, that's not the key point for today, but, but uh, you know, I just, it's, it's good to know that. So all this stuff implies that um, this game is 1-1 one, one smooth in the sense of 364A. There's one sort of technical difference, which is it's 1-1 one, one smooth under the overbidding condition. Okay, so the smoothness, the smoothness definition I, I gave you last quarter, it was for all, uh, bas it was basically, um, you know, there's an inequality that had to be true for an optimal solution S star and for all S. So here, it's going to be true for all S that satisfy no overbidding. Okay, so this is a little twist, but it's basically the same thing. Um, when no overbidding holds. Okay, and so this means the theorems that we approved last quarter simply apply immediately to this game. Now, last quarter we weren't talking about Bayes-Nash equilibria, so it's actually not quite what we want, but you know, it's still, it's a good start. Okay, so the extension theorems that we had last quarter are immediately relevant to what I've told you about this game here, all right? So as a consequence, the price of energy bound of one half extends to all so again, thinking about it as a full information game last, like last week, uh, mixed equilibria, correlated equilibria, coarse correlated equilibria, as long as they randomize only over no overbidding uh, profiles. Okay, and that's the little twist that we need. So only over no overbidding bid profiles. So for example, if you consider, uh, so there's various ways to interpret no overbidding. The most draconian way to interpret no overbidding is just to redefine player strategy sets to be those where they don't overbid on any bundle. Okay, so then you'd have this automatically. Then every bid pro profile satisfies no overbidding. Yeah. So I wonder how the extension theorem works if there is no uh, pure Nash equilibrium? Yeah, good question. So I forget if we ever talked about that last quarter. We may not have, because we probably only applied it to games that had pure Nash equilibrium. It works out exactly the way you'd want it to work out, which is it just literally is still, still works in the following sense. So for the extension theorem to apply, um, all, you need, all you're responsible for proving is that whenever a pure equilibrium exists, then it is near optimal. And if there isn't one, you're off the hook. It's not your problem. The extension theorem still works. So, so then it's, so, so, that, so if there's no pure Nash equilibrium, then it's just optimal? Like the, the well, I, well, I would say for, um, right, so, okay, good. Uh, so remember, you have to prove it using this template. So it's not, it's not clear that just because there aren't any, you could prove a bound of one using this template. Mm -hmm. um, but in principle, you could have games where that sort of thing is true. I mean, so it's sort of funny because the extension theorem rescues you from uh, vacuity. I think that's the right word, right? So it could seem like you're proving something vacuous about this, non, this empty set of pure equilibria, but then the guarantee holds to these other sets that are guaranteed to be non-empty, mixed equilibria and so on. Okay, so in some sense, I mean, it kind of says, you know, you may have thought you were proving something about pure equilibria, but you weren't, right? Whether you knew it or not, you were proving it about these bigger sets. Yeah. So that's all still true here. It's a good question, excellent question. Okay. So again, so, so we're not getting to the punchlines yet. I, I just you know, want to remind you, you already know a fair amount about extension theorems, and also just point out that some of the technology I've taught you in the past is you know, equally relevant to the new games we're seeing now, okay? Other questions? Okay. All right, and so again, as far as, you know, so what do we do? So, okay, so this is good. You know, last week I only told you about pure equilibria, but fortunately the proof I showed you enables last quarter's extension theorem, so we get it for these more permissive concepts. It's a good start, but these are all traditionally viewed as full information concepts. And again, what we really want in an auction setting is 
Bayes' Nash equilibria. We want to model them as games of incomplete information. So that motivates the question, you know, can we also have one of these for Bayes' Nash equilibria? And we can, although we're going to need a different proof, and that's what I'm going to show you next. All right, so here's, here's what we want to bound, okay? So the Bayes-Nash price of anarchy. Now, for this to make sense, you need to specify a prior distribution, right? So the set of Bayes-Nash equilibria depends on the prior, okay? So if you want to argue that Bayes-Nash equilibria are good, you need to say with respect to what prior. And so this is defined as you'd think it would be. So basically, you just look at the welfare of a worst equilibrium over the optimal welfare. One thing I, I, I want to remind you, though, right? So in a, in, a game, in a Bayesian game where you have this prior of evaluations, it's not like there's some fixed optimal allocation, right? So the valuations are going to be different for different coin flips, right? Sometimes they'll be high, sometimes they'll be low, sometimes different players are high versus low. So, you know, the, the optimal welfare is a function of the input of the valuation profile V. And V is drawn from F. So even when we talk about the optimal welfare, what we mean is the optimal welfare on average over what the valuation profile is. Okay? So opt welfare for the valuation profile V. Okay? So for each possible V, we look at the maximum possible welfare and we average that over all the Vs you might see. Okay? So that's as good as we could do, obviously, with any auction. Right? That's what VCG would do, for example. Okay, and on top, we want the same thing of the worst Bayes-Nash equilibrium. So really, you know, for this lecture, we'll be talking about worst Bayes-Nash equilibria that satisfy no overbidding, et cetera, et cetera. And so here again, uh, we measure it in the same way. So remember, okay, l let me remind you what a Bayes-Nash equilibrium is. So remember strategies, when it's a game of incomplete information, it's a function from your valuation to your action. Okay, so it's a function of what you want, how do you act? So, it's going to be uh, welfare of, so I'm using sigmas for those functions. So this takes as input valuations and outputs actions, i.e. bid vectors, m vectors, okay? And so, all right, so given valuations, this is the corresponding bids of the Bayes-Nash equilibrium, sigma 1 up to sigma n, those are the bids, that induces an allocation, that allocation has some welfare, okay? Again, as you vary over what people's valuations are, you're getting different bid vectors popping out of their strategies, you're getting different welfares for the allocation, and again, we're just averaging, okay? So that's the definition. So this is how you measure performance of a Bayes-Nash equilibrium, this is how you measure the optimal performance. Uh, for simplicity, okay, so strategies are also allowed to be randomized, and we'll even use that in our proofs later, meaning, you know, just like in a game of full information, right, if I know my value is 10, maybe I'm going to randomize over bids in some way. In that case, you would also have an expectation here over the randomization over the actions in sigma, but that doesn't change anything I'll say today. So I'll often just omit that for simplicity, okay? So go ahead and think of the sigmas as deterministic. That's, it's not without loss, but all the proofs extend trivially to the randomized case. Okay, so we want to prove that this is close to one. It's certainly at most one. And, all right, so, any questions about that? Bayes-Nash price of anarchy? Good. We'll be talking about this all day today. So, uh, a question, though, is, there's this dependence on capital F, right? So, the price of anarchy is going to be different for different Fs, different priors. So, what F is sort of worth studying more than others? How should we choose F? And, uh, you know, pretty much any, you know, may, you know, there will be applications where maybe you really care about some particular prior, but, I mean, at the level of abstraction we're talking about, any choice of F would feel pretty arbitrary, frankly, and unsatisfying. So we basically want to say that this is good for as broad a class of Fs as possible. Maybe even for, like, every single F in the world. That would be great. Okay? Maybe for arbitrary priors F. So that's a little too much to hope for. And so basically, the rest of this lecture, I'm going to show you two results. Okay? So the first result is this one, which is, is that F is a correlated distribution. Uh, the price of anarchy can be bad, very bad. Okay? 
So again, remember prior distribution, it can be correlated or, or it cannot be correlated, it can be a product. Okay, so remember, it's a distribution over bidder's valuations. So correlated just means, you know, what it usually means. It means basically if you know one's valuation, it tells you something non-trivial about, say, bidder two's valuation. Okay? And if it's a product distribution, then it's just the product of the unconditional marginals. Right? So um, the first thing I'm going to show you in this lecture, uh, in the remainder of this lecture, is I'm going to construct for you a correlated valuation distribution where, you know, they're going to be submodular, even a special case of submodular, but the price of energy is going to be way, way, way worse than two. Okay? The second thing I'm going to show you in this lecture, the other thing I'm going to show you, is that if it's a product prior distribution, no matter what the distribution is, then it's a factor two. Okay? So we'll get a positive result for product distributions. We cannot get a positive result for arbitrary correlated distributions. Okay? So that's the high level takeaway. All right. So any questions before I... The example is a little bit detailed. It's going you know, to take five or ten minutes to go through. Any questions for that? Okay. So this will give you a taste of the truly twisted things you can accomplish with correlated prior distributions. All right, so proof of facts. So the bidder is, in fact, they're going to be unit demand, okay? So a special case of gross substitute, special case of submodular, all right? And not only that, a bidder's value for each item will be either zero or one. Those are the only possibilities. So there'll be items you want, you don't care which one you get, and items you don't want. So you should really think of the welfare maximization problem as just unweighted bipartite matching in this example, okay? So how many items are there? There's going to be uh, n plus root n minus one items. Okay, so essentially linear number of items. Also, just to keep the description of the example a little simpler, I'm gonna, I'm gonna allow myself reserve prices, okay? So assume each item has a reserve price of, 1 over n to the 1 sixth. Okay, so a small reserve price. Right. Now, I don't actually need this for the example. Uh, reserve prices can be simulated with dummy bidders. Right. So basically, if some item has a reserve price of R, then I can simulate that by just adding a dummy bidder who only wants that item and whose valuation is R for that one item. Okay? Then if you show me any Bayes-Nash equilibrium with the reserve prices, I can extend that to a Bayes-Nash equilibrium with the dummy bidders just by having them bid their valuation. Okay? So a lower bound with reserve prices carries over to a lower bound with dummy bidders, i.e. without reserve prices. Okay? But it's simpler if you just allow me the reserve prices. Okay, so, all right, so what is this capital F? What's this valuation distribution? Basically, I'll, I'm gonna give you a randomized algorithm to define the valuations, and so the prior is just the you know, distribution generated by that randomized algorithm. All right, so here's what we do. And a picture will help here. So again, bipartite matching. So over here we have the bidders. There's n of them. Over here we have like n plus root n items, basically. So of the items, we're going to choose a subset C of root n minus 1 of the items. Let's C for the common items. And these are chosen uniformly at random. So for all subsets of U that have this cardinality, we pick this one uniformly at random, okay? These are goods that everybody wants, okay? So this is C. And uh, again, think unweighted bipartite matching where an edge just says, yes, you know, the bidder's value really is one for that item. 
So everybody wants C. And remember, there's way more bidders than of these items. There's n of these, there's root n of these. Okay? So this is a very unbalanced, complete bipartite graph. All right. The other items are called special items. And each bidder is going to want to be interested in a distinct special item. And so the next thing we do is we, in our randomized algorithm generating the valuations, we randomly order S. Okay, so we label these items in S, 1, 2, up to N. And bidder I is going to want only uh, the ith special item, has no interest in the others. Okay? So precisely, for a given bidder I and a given item J, so remember they're unit demand valuations, so I just have to tell you their values for singletons. On bundles, you just take the max of all the singletons in there. So bidder I wants the jth special item. And it's also happy to have anything that's a common item. And it doesn't want anything else. Okay? So in the picture here, we have this set S, exactly the same cardinality as the number of bidders, and we have a perfect matching. Okay? And the items that are put in C are chosen at random, and the perfect match, the planted perfect matching, if you will, between the bidders and S is chosen uniformly at random. Okay? So that fully specifies, you know, for each possible set of coin flips, that fully specifies unit demand valuations for the bidders. So we can interpret this as a correlated valuation distribution. Okay? And it certainly is correlated. Right? So for example, the common items, everybody has value one for those. Right? Okay. All right, so question, what is the optimal welfare in this setup? N. And does that depend on any of the random decisions? No. Good. Right, so, right, so the biggest value anybody can ever get is 1, so the biggest welfare is clearly at most N. But there's always a planted perfect matching between the bidders and the special item. So you give everybody their special item, and you can get value welfare N. So the VCG mechanism would get welfare N, probably 1. So opt welfare equals N with probability one, okay? Now, here's the key point. Here's why this is such a nasty example for equilibria. So, you know, suppose you're bitter one, okay? Now remember how it works in these Bayesian games, right? So you know the prior distribution, that's common knowledge. You know your valuation, and you can do a, you know, Bayesian update, you can look at the posterior given your valuation, and that's all you know, okay? I mean, you know what other strategies people are using. But the point is that, you know, what do you learn from your valuation, right? You learn a set of exactly root n items that you want, okay? And they have some labels. You actually know, because you know the prior, you know one of them is a special one reserved just for you, and you know the rest every single person wants, right? But by symmetry, you have no idea which is which. Right? One of these root n items has zero congestion, the rest have crazy congestion. But by symmetry, you have no idea which is which. Okay? So, you know, so that's, the, that's intuition of why this is a disaster for equilibria. So key point, bitter eye can't identify its special good. among the root n it wants. Okay? So let's see how this really plays out. So why does, why does, so this is sort of the, this is, this is the high level bit of intuition. Uh, why does this actually imply that you can't get reasonable welfare with the Bayes-Nash equilibrium? Well, the first claim, and this is exactly why the reserve prices are useful, is I want to argue that a bidder can't just, you know, bid all over the place, bid for everything, okay? So the claim is that no bidder 
wants to choose an action that would have it, so remember, these are unit demand bidders, okay? So you only want to win one thing, okay? So people aren't going to bid on stuff which has value zero. That can't possibly do them any good. So there's these root end items that they want, and they may go for more than one, you know, to hedge, to sort of hedge, right? But they don't, they, what they really don't want to do is like win a lot of these, because their value is one, no matter how many they win. But of course, the price that they pay adds the more of these that they win, okay? So there's no way you want to pick an action where, with decent probability, you win lots of these things. Okay, so let's say more than n to the one-thirds items with probability more than one over n to the one-sixth. Okay, so I claim you'd never do this. You'd never pick an action which gave you this, which gave you a sort of distribution with these properties, because if you did, If so, you'd pay an expectation, well, 1 over n to the 1 sixth to the time, you'd, pay, you'd, you'd win strictly more than n to the 1 third items. And remember, because of the reserve price, you have to pay 1 over n to the 1 sixth on everything that you win. Okay? Or if you like, because of the dummy bidders that are in the background. Okay? So this here is, this is the reserve price. And your value is with probability one at most one. Okay, so this action will get you negative utility. Certainly, you're not doing that in equilibrium. Okay. So then, uh, let's see. So the probability then that bitter I wins its special item. Well, okay, so maybe, you know, occasionally it wins tons of stuff. So maybe occasionally it just wins all of the goods it wants, including the, its special item. So just I'll give you a n to the one-sixth to cover everything that's not excluded here. So this is when you win more than n to the one-thirds items. But then if you win at most n to the one-thirds items, by symmetry, all items are equally likely to be in there. And, uh, and there's root n items that you want, okay? So plus, so this is an upper bound on the number of items you're winning, okay, in the common case. This is how many items you're trying to pick your special item from. So this again is n to the one-sixth, okay? So in other words, you will almost never get your special item at an equilibrium, okay? That's what this says. So, and so now if you think about it, if pretty much nobody's getting their special item, right, then all of these are just going unsold, right, That's, and there's no way you're getting linear welfare. Okay, the only way you can, approach, you know, there just aren't many goods here, there's only root end goods here, so the only way you could get linear welfare is if a linear number of these goods were actually going to somebody who wanted them, okay? So, the expected welfare of a Bayes-Nash equilibrium so, okay, so for each bidder, some tiny fraction of the time it's getting its special item, plus, you know, maybe all of these get sold all the time, so that's another um, root n. So this is the common items. These are the special items. Uh, but in any case, this is of n to the 5 sixths. Okay, which means the price of anarchy is polynomial on n. Okay, a far cry from two. Okay. Now the one sort of technical fine print with the dummy bidders is when, you know when you so reserve prices clearly have nothing to do with welfare. Okay, it's just part of the mechanism. When you replace them with dummy bidders. It actually, right, so dummy bidders have some value and they might actually win something and then all of a sudden welfare could go up. But there's only a linear number of dummy bidders and the value that they have is just this reserve price one over n to the one sixth. So that, the dummy bidders might contribute another n to the five sixth term. Okay, so that actually doesn't, the lower bound still holds, all right, even with the dummy bidders. All right? So that's the, that's the lower bound. Any questions about that? All right. 
So again, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to sort of funnel in on, you know, what is the, you know, coolest thing that could be true, right? And we've known forever that we can't do better than a factor two. We proved that last week. Uh, you know, w even for pure equilibria flow information games, we're trying to extend to distributions, and now at least arbitrary correlated ones are out. Okay. So the best case scenario is. or a best case scenario at least, is product distributions. I should say an open research question is to identify classes of correlated distributions where you can have positive results. Obviously this is a rather special, rather pathological correlated distribution. And it's totally possible you can get good bounds for just swaths of correlated distributions. I have no idea, nobody knows, okay? So the positive results we know are just for the product case. And that's what I'm gonna show you now. So it's a little bit, I'm exaggerating a little bit when I say the best case scenario, but because conceivably, presumably, you could go beyond products, but um, arbitrary correlate is not going to work. So what would be great would be to get a factor to for all product distributions. So just one thing I want to point out. If you want, you can think about the full information case that we talked about last week as a special case of the Bayesian case. Okay? Full information game, that's where you know everybody's preferences, you know what everybody wants. Uh, Bayesian games, you model the uncertainty about what people's wants with a prior. So no uncertainty just corresponds to a prior with no randomness. Okay, a prior that's just a point mass. Okay, so that's a legitimate prior distribution F. It's a degenerate kind. You could have a distribution capital F, which just said this person's value is always this, second person's value is always this, third person's value is always this, etc. It's degenerate. If you want, you can think of that as a product distribution. Right, it's just a product of point masses. Okay. So even with this product restriction, you know, if we prove a bound that holds for every single product distribution, we're certainly proving bounds on the full information model as a special case, because full information corresponds to degenerate product point masses. Okay? Upshot being, we already know one half is tight for full information, so certainly we won't do better than one half for arbitrary product priors. The best hope would be we still get one half for arbitrary product priors, okay? and we will. Right, but that's the best we can do. Okay. So theorem and this is also, this is still in that same CKS paper. Okay, I'm sort of modernizing the terminology slightly, but, but really it's all there. Like I said, sort of before it's time, ahead of its time, that paper. Chris Tudelu, Kovacs, and Shapira. All right, so I'm going to be vague about um, the no overbidding condition. Uh, we'll just, you know, the one that you need will just pop out obviously in the proof. So I'm just going to start doing the proof, and then when we get to the end, it'll be clear what we need for no overbidding. It, it'll be nice, actually. It'll be pretty weak. It'll just be a sort of on average version of the no overbidding condition we had for the pure case. So uh, it will be no, no more worrisome than before. Okay, and as usual, the expectations on both sides of the key inequality are with respect to F. Okay? All right. Um, and so I'm just going to right now prove uh, this theorem specifically 
for simultaneous second price auctions, but it is, in effect, an extension theorem. So it's still going to be the case that whenever you have a smoothness-like inequality, which I'll write down now, um, it will be the case that bounds of that form, even though they seem like they're about pure equilibrium and full information games, those bounds extend via the proof I'm about to give you to Bayes-Nash equilibria. Okay? So I think it'll be easier to understand if I state it specifically for this model rather than abstractly. But as will probably be clear, um, the proof is quite generic. So let me just remind you what we already know for the full information case. So we know the smoothness like inequality. We know that for all valuations, for all bid vectors, there exists B star 1 up to B star n, these hypothetical deviations. So that, so this is the inequality I was calling 3 at the beginning of this lecture. Okay, so this is the one where we did all of the manipulation. We didn't use any of our hypotheses, but we did all the manipulation. So it's at, you know, so the, this is after you've invoked the equilibrium hypothesis in step two. Okay, so I'm going to call this star. So this has the flavor of one comma one smoothness. Okay, so. Uh, there's no, so this, oh right, so this is exactly what we were calling three. Okay. So this is immediately after we've applied the equilibrium hypothesis to get this entangled term, and it's also immediately before we've applied the no overbidding hypothesis to relate this back to the equilibrium welfare. Okay. So to derive this inequality, we literally used no hypotheses at all. We did not use that B was in equilibrium. We did not use that B satisfies um, no, any no overbidding condition. Okay, this is just for the choice of B star I's, and again remember this B star I says given V, look at the items I'm supposed to get in an optimal solution and go all in. That's the definition of B star I. We with that choice of the B star I's, this is true for every single bid vector B. Whether or not it's in equilibrium, whether or not it satisfies no overbidding. Okay, and this we already proved. Okay, this was the hard work last week. All right? So taking this as input, I'm just going to show you how to turn this into a Bayes-Nash equilibrium bound. Okay? And that's going to be a generic argument. Okay? That'll be an extension theorem for Bayes-Nash equilibria. Okay? It'll be a little bit of work, but it'll, you know, next 10, 15 minutes, the rest of the lecture. Is that clear? All right, so this, this is just true. We're taking this as proven. Okay. Good. All right. Okay, so let's start the proof of this then. So consider a Bayes-Nash equilibrium. And, you know, when we, again, when we need it, we'll impose the appropriate no overbidding condition to complete the very last step of the proof, okay? All right, now, So we're responsible for proving a bound on the quality of this equilibrium, a lower bound on its welfare. And as usual, you know, the main thing we have going for us is this is an equilibrium. Okay, so if we let players deviate, then we can lower bound their equilibrium utility. And so, okay, so, th so that's the first step. We have to figure out, okay, so what, what, you know, again, here's the art. What deviation should we invoke? Okay. So there's an obvious idea. So the first step is going to be, so the, well, all I'm saying is the first step is going to be the same thing of the template. Okay, lower bound utilities by invoking the, in this case, Bayes-Nash equilibrium condition. So to lower bound I's expected utility in sigma, all right, so what hypothetical deviation should we use? Well, your initial response should be, didn't we already solve this problem, right? Isn't that the whole point of these B star I's, right? So B star I's say, you know, look at the optimal solution, go all in for the items that you get in the optimal solution. So it seems like that's what we should do, right? So you just use the deviation B star I of V. So 
So there's a problem with this idea, though. So I want you to think for a minute about why we can't do this. Yeah, so v, v is the valuation profile of all the players. So, so to review, we agreed that, you know, one of these deviations, B star one, remember what this is. Look at the items you get in the optimal solution and go all in. We agreed that, you know, knowing V1 is not enough. You need to know all the Vs. You need to know the valuation profile. But once you know the valuation profile, you can define B star one, for example. So that's why I wrote B star I of V where V is the whole profile. But I claim this actually doesn't make sense right now. So let's recall kind of, you know, this, the information available to players when they reason about how to act in a Bayesian game, okay? The whole point of a game of incomplete information is you don't know what other players want. Okay, so what's public is the prior distribution and the other thing that one thinks of as public is the strategy profile. Okay, so like if, I, if I only knew what you wanted, I'd know what you would be doing. I'd know your action, right? But then the uncertainty is all modeled. Well, I don't know your valuations exactly. I just know it was drawn from this prior, okay? And of course, I know my own valuation with certainty. Okay, so I know the prior, my valuation, and the strategies. But knowing the prior, my valuation, and the strategies is not enough information for bitter eye to compute this deviation, okay? So the problem is that this is not well-defined given the information available to I when it's reasoning and how to act, okay? That's why this doesn't make sense. So problem, I only knows VI, not V minus I, okay? So this B star I operator, you know, we don't have an input for it. Okay, so that's sort of too bad, but I mean, if we were really stubborn about wanting to kind of prove things this way, you know, stubborn about the fact that we want to, you know, piggyback on the solution we already have for the full information case, use these B star I operators, well then, okay, we need to somehow come up with an input. We need to feed it in evaluation profile so it can tell us how to bid. You know, tell us what hypothetical deviation to consider. We've got VI, that's cool, okay? We don't have V minus I, but we do have a prior. So, I guess we could kind of come up with our own fictitious profile for the other players, and it would at least be well defined to stick that into this deviation suggester. It's not clear this will get us anything, but at least it starts being, making sense again, okay? So, bitter, and again, all of this is just a thought experiment for the proof. Like, we're not literally thinking of players reasoning this way, right? We just need some lower bound and equilibrium utility, and so we need some deviation. We have what seems like a really good way of generating deviations, and we're just missing this V minus I. So where do we get it? Just in our proof, we're going to sample from uh, the prior distribution, okay? So that's, I, I think that's kind of the simplest way to salvage this idea, and happily it works, okay? So I'm gonna call this the doppelganger trick. You heard it here first. So, here's what we're gonna do. Here's the deviation we're gonna use in our proof. Okay, so bitter I knows its valuation VI, and it knows the prior. So it samples a profile. It only needs W minus I, but humor me. I'm going to sample everybody uh, from F. So in other words, I'm, gonna, I'm basically giving you a randomized algorithm for bitter I. And so this is just a mixed deviation, which is allowed. You can do mixed actions in you know, Bayesian games. It's fine. So first, I sample types for everybody, valuations for everybody. Uh, now, I plug in to my B star I, which sort of tells me a deviation. I plug in my real valuation, which I know, VI, and I plug in W minus I, these doppelgangers for the other players, okay? And then that tells me a deviation to consider, all right? Choose action, 
bi star. Okay. So what we're doing is we're saying, well, <laughs> you know, bitter eyes doing whatever it's doing at equilibrium. If it really wanted, if it was crazy and it really wanted to, it could do the following instead. It could sample doppelgangers. It could compute the welfare maximizing allocation. It could look at the items as star i it gets in that welfare maximizing allocation. And then it could bid all in for those items. All right? It's a well-defined strategy. And we're at a Bayes Nash equilibrium, so this well-defined strategy gives you only lower utility. Okay? And that's, that's really, we have a little bit of kind of uh, manipulation to do, but that's really the, the key idea of the proof, actually, right there. Okay, so the key idea is to still piggyback on what we did in the full information case, even though it's not full information, and just make it work by sampling the doppelgangers to bridge those two worlds. Okay. All right, so any, any questions? Before we go to the rest of the proof. Okay. All right, so here's the, here's the derivation then. All right, so let's just focus on a single bidder. Uh, so again, so now at a high level, we're doing the same thing we're always doing. We're getting a lower bound on I's equilibrium utility. Later, we'll sum them up and sort of, you know, relate everything to terms we actually care about. All right, so how well, okay, so what is, in fact, I's expected utility in the equilibrium? Well, VI is known, V minus I is unknown, so we're averaging over what V minus I might be, drawn from uh, the rest of the distribution. <coughs> Given all the valuations, these are the actions that are played, and I get some utility. Okay, so this is how well I is doing at the equilibrium sigma. And of course, it would only do worse if it switched to this, the sigma star i. Okay. So now let's expand this just using the definition of what sigma star is. Okay? So this, right, so this itself is randomized, right? This is basically an algorithm which is doing that, okay? So this is equal to averaging over V minus I, that's just the other's types. But then this is averaging over the coin flips of bitter I's deviating algorithm. And uh, let's see, so now it's UI, and given that it chooses the coin flips W, it's going to play the strategy B star I, V I W minus I. Again, this just means you make up the doppelgangers, you look at the optimal allocation, and you go all in for your items in the optimal allocation in that problem. Other people, of course, are just doing their thing. Okay, so this definition is sigma star I. Now here's where I'm going to use, so the place where we actually use is a product distribution, which again we know is necessary and must be used in the proof. The previous example shows that. It shows up in this very subtle way. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to change this VI into a WI. Actually, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me double check. Actually, let me do two things. Let me stop there and then tell you what the next two steps that I'm going to do at once. Yeah. So next, I'm going to do two things. So first of all, right, so, we have, so we have this inequality, equilibrium utility, some deviation utility. Uh, this is true whatever VI is, right? So remember, bitter I optimizes separately each for each possible, for each valuation VI that it has. But I'm just going to average this inequality over the VIs. So I'm going to apply the expectation. So I'm going, to, I'm going to integrate out over I's valuation. Okay, the inequality, of course, is still true by averaging. And then two, 
I'm also going to exchange, I'm going to change that VI to a WI. Okay, and the reason I'm doing that is because that'll put it in the wheelhouse of the smoothness inequality ultimately. Okay? But just for model checking purposes, I'm going to exchange that VI and WI. And the reason I can do that is because these are IID, and if you think about it, it's sort of subtle. This is important that F is a product distribution for me to get away with doing this. Okay? So there's this V minus I floating around, there's a separate W minus I floating around, but because F is a product distribution, I can basically mi mix and match. Okay, V I W I, V minus I, W minus I, doesn't matter. There's no correlation between them two, so I can interchange them willy nilly. Okay? But I encourage you to think about that a little bit offhand. I encourage you to think about where this exact proof would break if F was correlated. And it's in this step. Okay. So, therefore, so now, oop, 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 oop. I want you to think about, well, no, I guess I've averaged out. So, here's where we are. Averaging over the type profile of just um, bitterized utility. We can lower bound the ex ante equilibrium utility of bitter I by this expectation over two IID type pr profiles, valuation profiles of UI BI star W sigma minus I V minus I. Okay? So that's just immediately applying these to these. Okay, so now we're going to sum over the bidders. And, okay, so the reason I wanted to massage it into this form is because once I sum over the bidders, this matches exactly uh, our smoothness inequality. Okay, so what's inside the expectation on the right-hand side here is going to be of the form uh, the left-hand side of our key smoothness inequality. Okay. So, sum over i, apply star, that's what I mean by the smoothness inequality, and we get that the sum of the x anti utilities All right, is lower bounded by, again, we have this expectation over both the real valuations and the doppelganger valuations. And now applying the smoothness inequality, we have an opt of W. All right, so here we have B star I of W. And uh, remember, B stars are a function of the valuation profile. So here, you're always optimal solution with respect to the valuation profile for which you were defining the B stars. Here, we're defining the deviation profiles with respect to the doppelganger valuations W. So the bound is with respect to the optimal welfare for W. Okay, so that's the first term from the smoothness inequality. And then the second term Right, so where, do the, where does this, this is in terms of the Bs, which are the equilibrium bids, okay, so the B minus Is. So when we apply that, after summing these, that corresponds to applying them to the sigma minus Is of V minus Is, or sigma of V, okay? So minus sum over I equal one to N, sum J and Si, so here it's gonna be sigma of V. Okay, i.e., what's happening at equilibrium, okay? And then up here, and for bij, that now becomes sigma i of vi. So remember, this is the valuation, this is the bid, the bid is an m vector, we're looking at good j, so for this to make sense, I take this m vector and I look at bid j, okay? But again, what's b over there, that role is just being played by sigma i of vi here. So that's what we get. Okay, so again, what did we do? We took this, we summed, 
I put the sums inside the expectations, and then I applied our smoothness inequality star to what we got in here. And this is what we get. Okay? Any questions? Okay. All right. Good. And, um, all right, so now, we just, now we're done. All right, so we should say what the no overbidding condition is. Okay, so this term doesn't depend on V. Okay, all we're doing here is looking at the optimal welfare averaging over the doppelganger types, but the doppelganger types W are just drawn from the true prior. So this term is just the opt expected welfare. Okay? That's what this becomes. It doesn't matter if it's W or V. I mean, W is made up, but who cares? It's from the right distribution. So this gives us the right benchmark. And the way I want you to think about this, okay, so this is independent of W, right? So now you can just forget about W, just focus on the true types, V. All right, so fix I. What is this? This says, look at in the equilibrium. Remember, sigma of V is the Bayes Nash equilibrium we started with. It says, in the equilibrium, look at the items that I wins and look at how much it bid for the items that it wins. Okay? So in English, this is just the total bid by bidder I on the items it's winning in the equilibrium, in the Bayes Nash equilibrium. Okay? So I'm just going to write that in English, actually. Um, so this is just, sorry, it should be an expectation here. Expectation over the equilibrium, I's total bids on items it wins in the equilibrium. Okay? So it's a it's a you know it's a lot of letters, but it means something very simple. Okay? So again, I just simplified. This right hand side is exactly the same as this right hand side. Okay, great. So that's basically how. You take the smoothness inequality and using the doppelganger trick, extend it to <coughs> something about Bayes Nash equilibrium. Now, at no point, now we're not done, and in fact, we haven't proved anything because I haven't used a no overbidding hypothesis. And we know that nothing is true without a no overbidding hypothesis. But at this point of the proof, it's clear what no overbidding hypothesis we need to conclude. Okay? So, what do we have? Over here, we have the sum of player utilities at equilibrium. Again, utilities are just values minus prices, so that's even smaller than the welfare. So the expected welfare at equilibrium is lower bounded by this, lower bounded by the optimal expected welfare, what we want, minus this error term. <coughs> so our no overbidding condition is just, this should be, well, what do we need it to be? For our factor two, in the, in, the, in the full information case, we wanted our error term to be at most the um, equilibrium welfare, the Nash equilibrium welfare. Here we want it to be at most the Bayes Nash equilibrium welfare. And so we only need to upper bound this by the average welfare of bitter I in the equilibrium. Okay? So we insist that this is at most <coughs> averaging over the types. Um, VI of SI of sigma of V. Okay? I.e., I's expected contribution to the welfare, to the overall welfare. Obviously, a sufficient condition would be that this would hold always. Right, so, so that with probability one, uh, the sum of your bids on what you win is at most your value for it, but all we need for this proof to go through is that this holds on average, okay? So if sigma, the Bayes Nash equilibrium, satisfies this no overbidding property for every single bidder I, then we can upper bound each sum end of the error term by its contribution to the welfare. So the whole error term is the expected welfare. So we move that over and we divide and we're done. So under this no overbidding condition, expected welfare of the Bayes Nash equilibrium sigma is at least one, one half times opt expected welfare. Okay?
Any questions about that? So wh what I hope is clear is that this whole doppelganger trick uh, is generic in the sense that if I gave you as input some inequality of the form star, and again, so what does star say? Again, it basically means for each valuation profile v, but independent of the bid vector b, you compute these deviation, uh, these deviations, b star 1 through b star n, so that this holds for every bid profile p. If you give me, in effect, an algorithm for generating these hypothetical deviations that proves this inequality, the doppelganger trick just pushes that inequality through to an analogous inequality that averages over the prior distribution, assuming that prior distribution is a product, assuming that valuations are independent. Okay, so it wouldn't matter if you had sort of different factors in the opt and in the second term, those factors would just carry through and so on. So that's sort of a one-one smoothness. If you had a lambda mu smoothness, you would get a lambda over one plus mu uh, more generally instead of one half, okay? So even though I proved it just in this one case for concreteness, think of this as a one extension theorem for Bayes-Nash equilibria. Okay, let's, uh, let's resume in 10 minutes. We'll talk about first price auctions.